Uncle Cracker saw more success in more different genres of music than anyone I could think of in recent history. He started rapping with his best friend, Kid Rock, in Michigan. By the way, Michigan is the entertainment and rock capital of the world. Then went to the top of the pop and rock charts here and around the world with Follow Me. In a little while, smiled. The Dobie Gray cover, Drift Away, which moved into the adult contemporary charts. That's right. It, it moved into the adult contemporary charts so long it couldn't be evicted. It was there so long they had to try and get people in, but nobody could top that. He was there so long. <laughs> then he topped the country charts for five weeks with Kenny Chesney. Okay, that was a collaboration on The Sun Goes Down. You can catch Uncle Cracker July 26th in the arena. At Trump Taj Mahal is part of the Under the Sun tour with Blues Traveler, Smash Mouth, and Sugar Ray. For everything Uncle Cracker, including midnight special and tour dates, go to UncleCracker.com. There you can hook up with him with Facebook, Twitter, and, and all sorts of stuff. Please welcome the music genre invading Uncle Cracker. Hey, Cracker, welcome to the Mark Berman Show. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate that. That intro, I was sitting there trying to listen to it, and well, I heard every ounce, and I was just like, oh, my goodness, I, don't know how you, I didn't know how to come in after that. Thank you for that. No, no, it's, it's real simple because, listen, good music is good, but great music lasts forever, and people are still listening to the stuff you did. They're going to listen to the stuff you're going to be doing, but you've put out some great great stuff and the people have spoken in going out to uh well now download the records because there are no more record stores hey where in michigan did you grow up i grew up in detroit just outside of detroit actually in a town called mount clemens about 15 minutes north of detroit okay so detroit michigan now wow you've done so many different genres of music so living in detroit uh, who influenced you to go into music well, growing up, my house was either, it was all Motown. You know, my dad would play Motown religiously. So just growing up was all Motown. Either that or my dad used to listen to either, my dad listened to some country. He listened to three people. He listened to Conway Twitty, Patsy Cline, and George Jones, and that's it. So it was either Motown or those three. But then my mom would always rock like that AM70 stuff. You'd hear like B.J. Thomas. <laughs> Barry Manilow, you know, James Taylor, stuff like that. So it was pretty uh, across the map. But as I started getting older, Bob Seger was kind of like the unicorn in Detroit. Still is. You know, you, Bob Seger to us is like our, you know, you, you bow down when Bob, when Bob Seger shows up, if he shows up, you know. So, so, just, so, you know, listening to a lot of that stuff growing up, it was very, I don't know, it was a good time. Well, you know what, just growing up in that time frame anyway, it was a good time for radio, it was a good time for artists, it was a good time for everyone. I remember listening to the radio stations in Detroit, and it wasn't, nothing was really classified or grouped as, you know, you could turn on the radio station and you'd hear like a, you'd hear a rock and roll song and you'd hear an R&B song right after it. Where did you meet Kid Rock? Because he's your best friend, isn't he? Aren't you great friends with him? Yeah, yeah, that's my best friend, has been for shoot forever long time now and still best friends to this day you know just um you know that was one of them relationships where he thought you know you know i even signed like a production deal with him throughout the he's been my boss not only my best friend but my boss for most of my career and i just you know it was just one of them things where he just went in and he, i said to myself you know what i'll never let this get in the way of our friendship and i never have Never have, nor will I ever, and um, men couldn't ask for a better friend than Kid Rock. So many people may not know this, but you actually co-wrote some of his biggest songs. Which ones did you have a hand in writing with him? Um, I mean, looking back, I just, you know, Only God Knows Why, Cowboy, Ball With The Ball, um, even as, you know what, even as recent as All Summer Long, things like that, wow. so... Throughout the years, you know, we've we've always tried to pen stuff together, and uh, it can always work out. You know, with times time, you know, timing wasn't always on our side. Obviously, I'd be on tour, and he'd be home making a record, and, or vice versa. So, you know, there was a big gap where we couldn't do stuff together anymore. You know, just because of scheduling conflicts, I guess. But you know, we try to whenever we can get together and and do that. We're talking to Uncle Cracker. Hey, so now, 
uh, you've had your friendship, you've worked with Kid Rock, but all of a sudden it happens. Now enters Uncle Cracker, a solo career and mega hits, not only in this country, but around the world. How did you go from Matthew Schaefer to Uncle Cracker, and where did the name come from? Um, well, growing up, we, we spent a lot of time taking a, you know, there was no music scenes where I grew up. Your, your music scene was in Detroit. So you kind of based yourself, you know, in and around Detroit. And we ran, we ran through and in a lot of different circles, and Cracker was just a name. Um, that they had given me, you know, when I was young. And as I got older and I got my own record deal, solo deal, uh, there was already a band called Cracker. So, yeah. you know, for, you know, a lot of legal reasons, you know, we had to be, we had to be something different. You know, I had to be, I had to put uncle in front of it or, and, um, the uncle part just came at a time when, you know, when the attorneys at the record label were like, ah, we had to, you know, we were looking at being, um, you know, I could have been Cracker. Uh, featuring Matt Schaefer, you know, and I didn't want that. I right. wanted, you know, a single name or, or something. And then, then, you know, we thought about DJ Cracker, but I started because I was DJing for Kid Rock. I wasn't making a mixtape for a DJ record either. People were already like kind of, they were kind of getting it wrong. Like, oh, you got a record coming out? What kind of stuff will you be spinning on your new record? You know, and I, and I was like, well, it's not a mixtape either. You know, though I scratched records behind Kid Rock. I, I still wasn't, you know, the the club mixtape DJ guy either. So, so I didn't want to be DJ Cracker either. And, and, and uh, we happened to be on a Devil Without a Cause tour, and I was on a layover in a smoking lounge in Nashville Airport, and there was a picture on the wall of Uncle Dave Macon, and uh, and I was kind of reading about the guy, and he was just this guy that played this banjo, and uh, he would ride his horse and buggy to and from in town and then back home and he would sit back and play his banjo because the horses knew their way and people would follow his wagon because he would just be picking his banjo to and from. So I don't know, the uncle part, this is kind of, I just kind of adopted the uncle in front of the cracker because I was tired of thinking about it. Do you ever get to the point where you say, hey, look, you know what, I, I like being a DJ and, and every once in a while I like to feel that again. And do you ever have a, do you have a setup of Techniques 1200s set up uh, at home and you go in there and uh, scratch a little bit? Mark, I have 1200s set up at the house and I don't think I've touched them in, in years. Just, oh no, don't tell me that. <laughs> okay. I, uh, well, you know, by the time I, when I kind of took a departure, when I, when I branched off and started doing my sure. solo thing with Kid Rock, that was at a time when, you know, mixing records became so like, nowadays, you know, they started putting your, uh, they started putting the beats per minute, you know, digitally on the mixers. So it kind of took of art out of blending and mixing, you know. So to me, it just started becoming so insignificant, you know, that, that everybody could now do it just by reading the, the numbers. And I don't know, I, I, I didn't have a bad taste in my mouth, I guess, but I did. I did have a passion for doing what I was about to do, and that was do the solo thing. So, sure. I, and, and I also kind of, I kind of weaned myself away from it also because, you know, earlier on, you know, they wanted to promote you, you know, the Yoko Cracker record by having you come into a club and spin for 30 minutes or, or something like that. And I was like, no, no, I'm not going to do that because, <laughs> I, you know, because all you're doing there right. is just fueling that fire that, you, you, you know, you, you know, we're trying to, you know, break away from that. And sure. So, but they are still, in fact, when I left, I know they don't make 50, 1200 anymore, but when I left, I just, I bought, they came out with this, like, limited, rare edition. They were all black, and all the hardware yeah. was gold on them. Yeah, yeah. And I, <laughs> I just bought those, and they just came to the, and they weren't even out of the boxes when I had to leave. Where did you write uh, Follow Me? I mean, I like to ask this. When people have a mega hit like that, let's face it, it was. Where, where'd you, I like to find out where they wrote it. Where, where did it come to you? You know what? Honestly, I had uh, well, it's kind of a weird story. You know, it was, it was, I was just out of high school and uh, ended up in a position where I didn't have a license anymore for a little while. So I had to spend a lot of time at home. And uh, oh. I just yep. kind of like... You know, I was listening to a lot of, like, I don't know, back even then at the time, I remember listening to a lot of, like, Neil Young and uh, James Taylor and things like that. And I just kind of, like, I penciled that sitting around my room not too long after high school. 
And, uh, we only have a couple seconds left with Uncle Cracker. Go ahead. Yeah, so just um, I was I was actually I was probably nineteen in my bedroom just pencilling okay. that thing, and uh, and I sat on it for a, a, probably about three years before my deal, and uh, and then. I hadn't even recorded it, just had it, and I just always had it in my pocket. Uh, and it was kind of like a, I don't know, it was just kind of paying homage to all the Motown stuff, the things that I grew up listening to at that point. So um ended up recording it for that record. And I, I remember um, people not even wanting it on the album, and uh, it ended up saving my album, actually. And, and wow. Yeah, it's funny how that works. Did you do something with the Jordanaires, Elvis Presley's backup group? What'd you do with them? Yes, um, on my second album, I had a song called Memphis Soul Song on there that we released as a single. And what we did was we went in and we did a remix and had the Jordanaires do the, um, had them do all the harmonies on everything. Um, wow. I, you know what, you're, you're an incredible guy. I mean, you, you just, Mark. Are, I'm sure you're just having fun, man, because now another one. Okay, so. Oh, you gotta hear this though, so, Mark. You gotta hear this. I remember this is, this is, it feels like forever ago, but I remember yeah. doing the, um, you know, having to get the remix done. And, uh, and I remember the Jordanaires, you know, obviously, you know, Elvis, that's all you can think about when you think of the Jordanaires, but I remember we had to keep rescheduling the date because one of the guy had a hair appointment. And he couldn't break. And then another, another one of the Jordanaires had, a, he had to go fishing on a certain day. We couldn't schedule it for that day. Um, I couldn't get him in the video. You know, we filmed some of the video like in and around like a club or a bar type of situation. And we couldn't get them in the video because it was secular, being that it was in a bar. Yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty cool. fun, stuff that I'll never forget. You've done crazy stuff. So it was the rap, and then you did this uh, Memphis stuff, and then, of course, you're rock, and then all of a sudden, bam, you have another mega hit with Kenny Chesney, and now you're you're being looked at as, as I guess, country, country rock. Uh, how'd that come about? Um, well, w one day uh, I was just sitting there, you know, and, and here, well, Kenny Chesney had met Kid Rock somewhere on the road, and Chesney asked Kid Rock, he said, hey, man, I want to, I'm playing uh, my first stadium show at Neyland Stadium, which is his hometown in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, and he said, he said, you think I can get your buddy Uncle Cracker out there? And, and Kid Rock says, I don't know. Call him and ask him. So so, <laughs> so Bob calls me, which I was Kid Rock. And it, so Bob calls me and he says, uh, he says, hey, there's this guy, Kenny Chesney. I gave him your number. He's going to be calling you. He wants you to school with him somewhere at the, or whatever. Damn. Uh, all right, and then Kenny was Kenny calls and like, you know, I I had a date somewhere else. Uh, it actually turned out to be nice. He was like, "Well, I'll just send a jet." So I did this other thing, and they flew me into Knoxville, and uh, and just you know, and he and I just hit it off. We just became great, great buddies, man. He's he's one of the nicest guys on the planet, and uh, really worked out very fun, very cool, and well, it worked out great for me. My goodness, huh? I wasn't yes, at all in any that country, and, <laughs> you know, I couldn't have asked for anybody. But, you know, it was just something, something very cool. Well, here's the thing, though. He asked me to come out and do this show with him. Well, afterward, you know, we got to hanging out, and, and then he started playing this song, and he's like, man, I want you to do this one with me. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, whenever, just let me know. Well, then, like, a couple weeks goes by, and I, and I was, I finally, I texted him, I was like, hey, what's up with that song? I was like, I was like hopefully, hopefully he didn't forget about it either, you know, so... I was like, hey, what's up with that song? He's like, oh, man, did you really want to do that? And I was like, well, yeah. So um, I just flew to Nashville and cut that. And, man, I, you couldn't ask, I couldn't ask for a better situation to fall in. We're talking to Uncle Cracker. Listen, you're out on tour. Right now you're coming here to Atlantic City, and it's the Under the Sun tour. This tour, when I saw it announced, excited me no end. And, in fact, I, l I will be there, by the way, uh, on awesome. the 26th. Yeah, I, oh, I can't wait. So, anyway, you're out on the road with John Popper, Mark McGrath, and Steve Harwell. Okay. How much fun is this? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a uh, it's like a geriatric clinic out here. I'm oh, kidding. stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But it is, is like a... 
for me, this is a tour of the summer. I love it. Every band in this thing is amazing. You know what? It's, it's, you know, it's funny. I, I seen a tweet from Seth Rogen, and he tweeted the tour poster for this tour. And he said, this would have been my, he said, let me say something. He said something like, this would have been my Woodstock back in 96 or something like that. I thought it was funny, but you know what? This tour is a whole bunch of fun. It's, you know, just when I was first coming out, it seemed like me and Sugar Ray and Smash Mouth and Bruce, everybody was kind of jockeying for position at that point years ago. So this is really like a high school reunion for me with these, you know, I, me and Mark McGrath have maintained good friends throughout the years. We still keep in touch all the time. So, so do me and Harwell from Smash Mouth. And, uh, it's fun to be out here with people that have fun, want to, you know, obviously want to have fun. And, uh, you know what? It's just fun. McGrath called me this winter and asked me if I would be interested in doing something like this because, you know, he kind of spearheads this whole thing, this whole Under the Sun tour. And, and of course, I said, yeah. And, uh, you know what? I just, it's not about money. It's not about none of that. It's just about fun. And it's, and it's fun. And, you know, and every one of us are still blessed and lucky to still be able to play in front of a bunch of people that have heard it, you know, before or, or bought it or used to listen to it or, you know, just to, just to be able to do that is, you know, I'm, I couldn't ask for anything more. Yeah, and on the 26th, you're going to do it inches from the Atlantic Ocean on our boardwalk right off the beach in a 5,000-seat arena in Trump Taj Mahal. Oh, Mark, Mahal. can I tell you, I have yeah. never, in all my years of touring, 15 years of touring, I've never been to Atlantic City, not once. Oh, the humanity. you got to be kidding me. I, I, you know, I've been to, like, Asbury Park and things like that years ago, and but never been to Atlantic City. It, it, probably driven past it a million times, but I'm excited to see Atlantic City just because I never, I don't know how I never have. I just, I never have. <laughs> Cracker, if you didn't have to work every night of the week during this summer tour, because I've seen your schedule, you're working every night. I mean, you're working every night. We would take you to the Irish pub right after uh, Trump Taj Mahal. You'd oh, hang what? out with us. We'd show you our side. We'd Bermanize you on Atlantic City. <laughs> 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 it would be, you would be initiated into the car bombs with Berman Society. We do a, a Irish car bombs from midnight to four on Saturday nights. Come on, but you can't. You know why? Because you've got to do the show, get back on the bus, and go somewhere else the next day. You're working every day. That's true. That's true. That is true. Did, did you have fun at the DTE Center? Was that a homecoming? It was. It was. And, you know, just growing up and having seen, you know, DTEs like the amphitheater used to be called Pine Knob. You know, people, it's funny because people in Detroit still call it Pine Knob, and, but it is DTE. And uh, but growing up, that venue, that's where you went and seen like Marshall Tucker Band with Leonard Skinner and uh, Charlie Daniels and Hank Williams Jr. would be all in a package together on, you know, at that hill, that amphitheater. So to to go home and, and do that it was, you know, it's the, just the amount of, oh my goodness, the adrenaline is. It's not even. It's not even fair. Like I shouldn't even be allowed to feel that good. <laughs> well, they also use the name. Don't they use the name Palace at Auburn Hills? And that's uh, legendary as well. I think they used yeah. to do concerts under that name there. What's yeah. next for you, Bob man? Seger, you Bob Seger will set up. Bob Seger will set up shop at the Palace Auburn Hills and do twenty nights in a row. Or something phenomenal. Like Eighteen or nineteen, I think he holds a record for there or something. Really? It's incredible. Yeah, it's like a. It's like he goes there and plays for the entire month. Something, wow. something crazy. So he's he, he to them is like uh, our Springsteen was in Philadelphia, where he'd come to the Spectrum in Philadelphia. I'm originally from Philly, and he'd sit there and he'd play for uh, for X amount of nights more than anywhere else. Oh, that's cool yeah. that, that he does that. So what's next for you? What are you doing now? You're writing some stuff. You're getting some new stuff. They're going to hear some new stuff when they, uh, or is it just the hits during the tour? It's just the hits during the tour. You know, I wouldn't want to bore these people with trying to sell them something new or. You know, everybody's kind of here. Like, I know McGrath even kind of sells, like, hey, if you're coming down looking for new music, don't come. Because it's <laughs> literally, you know, all four Excellent. of us will come out and do 45 minutes of just hits, and, you know, people are happy and done. Nobody has to sit through something they don't want to, or, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to take, uh, you know, people are coming, bringing their kids. It's just a fun, it's a fun summer vibe. Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of debauchery out there, you can tell still, but it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like taking them to a 
it's a fun show. It's fun for everybody, for all walks. And uh, it's just really, really, I don't know, man. It's just got a great summer vibe. Like, I, I don't know if, I don't know if, like, I don't know if he could have paired a better group of cats for this. You know, this is kind of a, this is something I'd never thought of, you know, throughout the years. Like, I could end up 15 years later doing something like this this summer. You know, I never, never thought about it like that. It's a great part of the 90s to find, and people can come out on the 26th to Trump Taj Mahal in the arena and catch it. Well, I don't even know if there's tickets left. Um, check. Call call Trump Taj uh, to make sure that there's tickets left. But this is an amazing show. Uncle Cracker, my guest, I want to thank you for spending a few minutes on the Mark Berman Show. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mark. 